get started here. Um, so for the for most of the for most of the evening, uh, we'll be sharing a screen uh, that has our PowerPoint presentation on it, just like we did in person. Welcome to everybody virtually. We're going to see how this goes with our new normal. Um, and uh, I will apologize ahead of time if we have any glitches um, or uh, technology issues. Uh, we'll get through it. We'll get through it. We're going to have fun with this. We'll, we'll figure out even maybe ability to have a little more fun than we do in person. Um, but, uh, but anyway, I appreciate your patience while we, while we kind of figure some of this stuff out as, as we're going through it tonight. So, um, all right, I'm going to, uh, share, uh, this, our screen here, uh, in just a second. Okay. So if, um, if anybody uh, runs into trouble, if you could use the chat feature, uh, that would be great. Uh, I'll try to uh, monitor uh, that as we go along. And uh, if a couple of my colleagues from SiteLogic maybe can just keep a half an eye on it as well in case I miss something, that would be great. Um, but welcome again to our, our second uh, long-term facility planning task force meeting. Um, under obviously very different circumstances than any of us are used to. Uh, we're going to see how this goes and uh, hopefully we'll have a good time with it nonetheless. All right, so tonight what we're going to try to do, what we're going to try to accomplish, and we're going for a shorter period of time, uh, and so we've got a little bit less on the agenda, but uh, we're going to talk just a, a bit about uh, what we can expect here over the course of, of April with our virtual meetings. Um, we'll do just a real quick review from our last meeting about what this work is that we're trying to do and how we're going to do it. And then what we're going to do is, is have kind of a, a setup uh, for a lot of our future work uh, by Dr. Brenner, uh, who's uh, your superintendent. Uh, he's going to talk through some of the background on uh, the Grand Forks Public Schools and um, Tom, we lost you. And uh, if we've got a little extra time at the end of the meeting, I, I lost you. Tom, can you hear me? We lost you. Lost you. Yeah, I don't know what happened to Tom. Tom, we lost you. Can anybody else hear Tom? No, sir. Are, are you there? Can you hear me now? Now we can, but we lost you for a while. Yeah, I, I saw that because my entire application shut down. So, um, can you see my screen still now? Yes. Okay. All right, so apologize yeah. for that. Hopefully uh, we'll, we'll figure that out and it won't happen again. Um, anyway, so uh, walking through, um, and you should have all received an email from me that had an agenda for April in it. Um, but what we're gonna try to do is continue this work that we've been doing uh, or that we started uh, last month. And we, we want to kind of maintain some momentum uh, forward. We know that whatever we're dealing with now with the, the, the pandemic is uh, in relative terms short-lived. And when we come out of that, uh, all of our same issues are still going to, uh, are still going to be there. And so we, um, you know, we want to keep, we want to keep working through those things. So what we did is said, if we're not going to be able to be together and talk about some of these things, there's a couple of different things that we're going to try to accomplish. We're going to send out kind of a video for you guys to watch uh, each week that uh, for the month of April, at least, kind of teases uh, our thinking as far as what schools are as we look forward into the 21st century and, and what, what school means to kids uh, in, the, in the 21st century. And so... That's really the intent there. 
We're also then going to walk through, we're going to start tonight, um, but each Thursday in our meetings, then we're going to talk in similar terms about Grand Forks specifically. Um, what it is you guys are doing in Grand Forks and what uh, your administrative team, your school board, uh, and folks in the district uh, are thinking about uh, what Grand Forks school districts look like going forward uh, into the 21st century. And the reason that this is important for us uh, is because as we look to try to get our arms around facilities uh, and what we're going to do from a facility standpoint, um, we, uh, we, we need to understand what happens inside of schools and how we're able to support that work with our facilities. And so, uh, so that's, that's what we're going to try to do through, throughout the course of uh, April here with our, our virtual meetings. We're also going to use surveys, um, and they won't be long. Uh, there won't be a whole bunch of questions, but just a couple of questions coming out of each meeting at the end of each week. So you'll get one from us tomorrow. Um, and that just gives us one more opportunity to provide you guys with that opportunity to output thoughts and ideas that we can then share with the whole group. Because obviously, we're not able to sit at small tables, have as easy a time with large group discussions. And that'll be one way that we, we have an opportunity to provide some of that information. So hopefully that works. Um, for, so for the week of April 6th, uh, Thursday, we're here. Tomorrow we send out that, uh, that agenda, uh, or that uh, survey, I'm sorry. And then uh, for next week, we'll look similar to this week. Tuesday, you'll get another video link from us. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we'll send you the survey results from, from this week. Uh, Thursday. Thursday will be another meeting for us, and then Friday um, we will um, we'll send another survey again. So and we'll repeat that through the month. When we get towards the end of April, hopefully we'll have a better idea of what May looks like. We may continue on this in May, maybe we cross our fingers. At some point in May, we're back together in person. We'll see, um, and uh, uh, we'll just kind of we'll, we'll we'll keep going uh, and and. Uh, pivoting and, and changing as we need to based on what's going on. All right, so what are we doing? Um, I'm not going to read through this. We kind of covered this last time uh, when, uh, when we were together, but just I wanted to recall that there was a, a uh, task or a uh, charge out there for the work that we're doing. And this here, and again, you'll get a copy of this PowerPoint presentation like you did last time, but this just outlines again um, those things that we're going to be looking at through this uh, this process over the next uh, many months. Um, I didn't want to forget our meeting norms as well. So our, our meeting norms uh, stay in place, um, just as important uh, as they, they have been. We're going to try our best to begin and end our meetings on time. Again, um, we'll be a little bit flexible based on what technology hands us. Um, Try to be attentive during the meetings as best as you can there at that home. We know every bunch of other things are going on probably in the background and just off uh, your camera screen. So, uh, but be as attentive as you can. Um, again, from folks, assume positive intentions. Uh, listen actively, seek to understand first, then respond, share the air, make sure everybody's voice is heard uh, because they're all, all voices are important. Um, keep this uh, district wide focus versus an individual focus. Um, and then, uh, and then our, uh, the solutions and ideas and priorities that we uh, work through really should focus on the needs and the vision of Grand Forks. Um, and then again, we're going to provide feedback and input to the school board, but ultimately the school board's going to decide what the actual direction forward is, be it a referendum or, or other options. Um, and again, just as a reminder, you know, our school boards are looking at several different things in this process to really determine what that direction forward is. Um, and community engagement process is a really important process of that. Uh, they're very committed to hearing what our task force has to say as they come out of this, as well as what we say going through it. Um, but that's only one component of, of ultimately what, what they have to look at when they, they determine that direction forward. And again, our process triangle on how we're doing our work. Right now, we're starting that process of learning, exploring, and understanding. We're going to spend a lot of time really trying to, to do that, really trying to understand what our district is, 
um, and uh, explore and learn about uh, what's going on in our district and what our hopes are for the future. Through that process, we'll be able to develop some priorities uh, that uh, we can use then as we take a look at uh, options uh, for direction forward. And then ultimately at the top becomes a solution and a potential referendum um, for part of uh, that direction forward. And again, we talked a little bit here about where our work stops and where the school board's work ends, or I mean, where our work ends and the school board starts. And that's really in that options area uh, where we'll probably come up with one or two or three kind of uh, options forward, uh, some recommendations, if you will, the school board will take that and ultimately they'll be the ones that decide that, uh, that solution. So as we go through all this stuff, um, again, we, we don't want to jump to uh, answers, uh, solutions immediately, uh, but we want to make sure that we're recording those things. And so uh, we're recording this meeting, we're recording the chat box. So if you've got uh, things that you uh, want us to uh, not forget about, then uh, you know, throw it in the chat box, send an email to us, uh, give us a call if you want, um, and, um, and, and we'll get that recorded to make sure that we come back and we talk about those things at the right time with the right subject matter. Okay. Um, everybody still hear me? Everybody still with me? Okay, see some heads nodding. All right, so with that, I'm going to uh, turn things over to Dr. Brenner, uh, the superintendent, and he's going to walk us through kind of um, that uh, timeline of the district and, and a little bit of how it developed out, um, some information uh, from your annual report, and then uh, talk a little bit about the strategic planning process uh, that's happened more recently uh, at the district there and what that means as far as taking a look at the future. And so, um, I just need to pass uh, some, pass the control to him. And Terry, I think you have it and can go with it. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. And on behalf of the school district and both school boards, I want to thank you again for participating in the facilities task force. Didn't have an opportunity on the opening night to share that with you, but please know how grateful we are uh, for your service. Uh, and the leadership that you're going to provide uh, as you move through all of the information and eventually come up with some uh, recommendations or a recommendation for the school board the uh, latter part of September. So again, uh, our gratitude is extended to all of you. Um, I'm going to, here we go, my clicker is working. Just wanna take you down memory lane. Uh, I, I love history and I know some of you out there uh, love history as well and if I could, uh, reincarnate, my, reincarnate myself, I would be a deep sea diver for uh, shipwrecks. I don't know if I could make a living doing that, but I do love history. And just putting this together um, really kind of sets the stage for uh, really what the future holds uh, for Grand Forks and the Grand Forks Public School District. So first of all, um, I don't know, it, Tom, it just changed on its own, so I'm going to try to backpedal here. Um, I hope it's not running on a timer. It should be on my clicker. Uh, the city was established in 1880, and the school district was first established in 1881, and our first building, the first public school building, was built in 1882. In 1884, let's see, what's this? My apologies, everybody. I think it wants to take care of itself here. Uh, Belmont Elementary School was built, and that was that had a couple of additions put onto it, and it closed after the flood of 1997, uh, giving way to the new Phoenix Elementary School. Tom, is there a way we can turn the timer off on this, or do I have to do that? Let me see once if we can. Uh, wasn't aware that you had a timer on there, or that we had a timer on there, but uh, we can see what's. Now, see if you're watching this on TV, there'd be a little sign up that says delay is due to technical difficulties. Right. Be back soon. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So 
I'm just going to stop the share for a second here while I try to figure that out. Um, Tom, under the duration button, it says 70 seconds. So you may want to stick that to zero. Oh, uh, yeah, I see that. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much for whoever caught that. Good job, Gina. And I think that might be, you might have to do that on each of the slides. So click on each slide, see if there's animation or if there's a duration. Yeah. There wasn't a timer before when we looked at this. No, I know. It didn't seem like it was anything. Tom, do you want me just to pull up my PowerPoint on my desktop? Um, I'm, I'm just checking it right now just to see once here, Terry, and see if there's a, uh, if the timer's running or not. I think it seems to be stable now. So let me uh, click back and share that again. Oops. There we go. Are we are we sharing? Are we back to Belmont right now? Yes, we're at Belmont. Okay. I, th I think we're stable because it's been on that slide now for a bit. So you can go right. forward, backward, whatever you need, Terry, from that. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, my apologies to everybody. I'm not sure why, uh, why it was trying to take control of itself. So uh, Belmont gave way then to Phoenix Elementary School after the 1997 flood. In 1881, let's see. I want to make sure we're going the right way on this slideshow here. <clears throat> 1881, the original Wilder Elementary School was built on the present site uh, where the new Wilder Elementary School sits, right on Gateway Drive. 1903, Winship Elementary School was built. Uh, that's also on the same site where Winship Elementary sits today. 1905, Wilder added a second story addition. I'll talk a little bit more about this history when we get to the new Wilder. In 1907, Washington Elementary School was built. So we had a series of schools uh, really anchoring the, the downtown area from Wilder to Washington. Washington is actually, um, I believe it's the rectory for St. Michael's Church now. And then if you drive through town, uh, you would eventually come to Belmont. So you can see where we had lots of elementary schools in close proximity. 1910, Roosevelt Elementary School was built, um, not too far away from where Belmont Elementary School was. Then in 1919, Central High School was built. Uh, this is the same beautiful building we have today, although there have been numerous additions, um, but you can see this is the crown jewel of our school district. In 1932, South Middle School was built. Uh, it was called South Junior High at the time. And that closed after the flood of 1997 and now serves as an apartment complex. Okay, here we go. It's trying to take off on me again. In 1948, Lincoln Elementary School was built um, pretty much uh, close to the Red River and that too also closed after the flood of 1997. So Lincoln Elementary and Belmont Elementary, those two attendance areas became one in the Phoenix Elementary School uh, neighborhood. It's trying to take control again, Tom. In 1949, West Elementary School was built uh, right along University Park and anchors one side while Valley Middle School anchors the other. 1953, Lewis and Clark Elementary School was built off of 13th Avenue South. So the district is starting to push south um, along Belmont and along South Washington. 1955, Valley Junior High was built, again, in close proximity to West. Uh, they have wonderful green space there between the two buildings along with University Park. Valley is now known as Valley Middle School. 
1957, the school district continues to push south beyond uh, just about at 24th Avenue South, uh, Viking Elementary School was built. Okay, now it doesn't want to advance at all. Here we go. In 1960, lots of work was done uh, both at the Grand Forks Air Force Base and in town. Lake Agassiz was built on the north end. Uh, Carl Van Eilson Elementary School was built at the Grand Forks Air Force Base. And Ben Franklin Elementary was built um, in what we now call Midtown. And interestingly, you can see the costs associated with building those schools in 1960. 1961, Schrader Junior High was built uh, right off of 32nd Avenue South, and it's now called Schrader Middle School. 1962, we added a second, uh, second school to the base as the base was growing. Uh, and just for historical purposes, there was a time at the Grand Forks Air Force Base in the 1970s and early 1980s when we had uh, a, pro a little more than 2,000 students between the two schools on base. In 1965, the new Wilder Elementary School was built, replacing the old Wilder. And when we added the two relocatables here about uh, four years ago, uh, when they were driving the, uh, putting the footings down for those relocatables, they actually hit the old foundation of the original Wilder Elementary School. In 1966, uh, the district continues to move south um, when Nelson, uh, excuse me, J. Nelson Kelly Elementary School was built. The very next year, a major project uh, was undertaken. And Tom, it looks like it's trying to move on, on the timer again, so I'll just keep clicking here. Um, Red River was built, giving the school district its second high school, uh, taking much of the pressure off of Central High School. And, and also, also an interesting historical fact here is, uh, we used to have St. James Catholic High School, junior high high school, and that that school eventually closed in 1969. So St. James was a, a pretty large high school uh, considering it was a private school in its day. In 1989, Century Elementary School was built uh, right off of 17th Avenue South and west of Columbia Road. In the 1990s, Community High School began its lease with the North Dakota School for the Blind and prior to that, uh, Community High School was located at the old Roosevelt Elementary School. In 1998, uh, which was alluded to already, here's Phoenix Elementary replacing Belmont and Lincoln Elementary Schools. 1999, new South Middle School off of 47th Avenue South was built, um, replacing the old South Junior High lost in the flood of 1997. So in the year and a half in between, uh, those students went to school in the basement of Red River and also the lower level of Sharon Lutheran Church. In 2000, the Mark Sanford Education Center was built, which moved uh, most of all the ancillary departments under one roof, like buildings and grounds, uh, special education, um, uh, instructional services, all departments uh, that you can imagine with the exception of child nutrition. There was uh, an area on this building to add another wing for child nutrition, uh, but that has yet to happen. In 2012, uh, we had three major projects uh, in the school district. The Central High School's theater was remodeled and a fine arts addition was built on the building, which created more space for band orchestra um, and some, uh, a black box theater and also a music classroom for vocal music. Also that same year, Red River High School added on uh, a performance hall uh, that seats about 750 people. And the other, the uh, third prong that happened during this year was the revitalization of the Cushman uh, complex. New turf, new track. Uh, when I say turf, football turf, uh, new track, turf. Um, so that was uh, about a $27 million adventure between those three projects. And in 2014, Discovery Elementary School was built. Uh, I just happened to know that number in my head at 14.5 million. Um, it was originally built to finish only the first level and not the second level. Um, but as the school was being built, the enrollment started to come in. So 
the district decided to finish the second floor and thankfully they did because uh, this school is filling up. So schools that have been taken offline in the last 50 years, uh, Washington Elementary School in the North End, Roosevelt, uh, which is on Cottonwood, I believe, Lincoln Elementary School near Lincoln Park, uh, Belmont Elementary School right off of Belmont, uh, close to downtown and South Junior High. So you can see that there's uh, some fluidity in a school district that changes do occur uh, in the long haul. It probably just isn't noticeable uh, because a lot of time, uh, time is spanned uh, between decisions when buildings are either taken offline or new buildings are built. And I'm not sure where we'd be without the flood of 1997 because uh, we were able to do a little more than $80 million worth of construction projects uh, at a total cost of the school district, uh, a little more than $330,000. FEMA picked up much of the tab uh, for that construction. I'm gonna move forward now into our annual report and just talk a little bit about some academics and uh, I know eyelids get a little bit heavy after dinner, um, so I'll try not to uh, put you to sleep. Um, we, we use uh, STAR, which is an online platform to assess our students, uh, both individually and compositely as classrooms and looking at schools. And we use the 40th percentile cutoff as identifying when students are above and below. And you can see how schools are uh, ranked in descending order uh, relative to performance. And this data goes back to the 2018-2019 uh, school year, I believe. Um, so you can see the percentage of students in each building that would be above the 40th percentile in reading. And then if you go over to the right, uh, you can see the percentage of students above the 40th percentile in math and those who are below. As far as the state assessment uh, is concerned, uh, our students in grades three through eight take the North Dakota State Assessment, which by the way is going to be waived this year uh, by the U.S. Department of Education, uh, given the uh, situation that we're in. Um, but basically there are four categories that we look at our students uh, in these grades. Uh, the categories are, you know, who's performing at the novice level, who's partially proficient, proficient, and advanced proficient, uh, both in English language arts and, and also in math. Um, this is a, you know, one snapshot in time of uh, school district performance. So we don't put all our eggs in one basket uh, and say this is, uh, uh, this is how we weight our school district. Unfortunately, it's the public audit uh, for the school district and other school districts across the state. So um, what, we, uh, what we like to see is a higher percentage of students who are in the proficient and advanced proficient range, um, but we do provide uh, lots of wraparound support services for those students who are partially proficient and who's, who are at the novice level. Um, and we identify formulas so that incrementally if a student is behind uh, in K1 or 2, uh, we know what kind of formula to build in to make sure that that student uh, catches up uh, by the time that student is exiting fifth grade. Uh, we, we offer a, a large number of advanced uh, placement, uh, placement courses. Um, I, I would say that uh, three to four years ago, uh, we entered into an agreement with the National Math uh, and Science Initiative, and, and we did this intentionally because we wanted to beef up our AP course offerings. Uh, we have lots of families who move into Grand Forks. We have a lot of families who are uh, connected to the military, um, and they know, they know good schools when they see them, they know great schools when they see them, and they know poor schools when they see them. Uh, so there's been some some good positive applied pressure on us to increase the number of offerings. So uh, if you look at 2018, 2019, you can see the, uh, the jump of students who enrolled in AP courses. And the reason for that significant jump between one year to the next is we started to allow freshmen to take AP courses because we added some new uh, courses like AP statistics, um, AP uh, economics, and environmental sciences has been a really popular course that some freshmen have jumped in. So we're really, really pleased with our AP uh, course offerings and the number of students who are taking AP courses. Uh, what's been our longstanding tradition academically would be dual credit courses. Uh, we have great enrollment um, of, of the number of students who take a dual class, which means for those of you who may not understand that, they're taking a high school and college course at the same time. They get high school credit for it and they get college credit for it. Um, if they can't afford to pay for the college credit, we have scholarships available. And um, 
you, you'll probably see one, one thing that jumps out at you when you look, when you compare Grand Fork Central to Red River, um, a higher percentage of students at Red River take dual credit courses uh, than does Grand Fork Central. We don't really know why that metric is the way it is. Um, it's not a financial hardship because again, I, you know, we offer scholarships for, uh, for any students who would like to take a dual credit course. And Central's administration is a little perplexed uh, as well. So we just need to talk to students and find out why they're not interested in taking dual credit courses. Our ACT scores are pretty well in the uh, average range when compared to state and when compared uh, at the national level. And all of our juniors take the ACT. Uh, when some of us were in high school, it was not a requirement. It was only required for those students who are interested in going to college. But now all students take the ACT and that's actually the, uh, the high school state assessment um, taken by juniors. And the other Terry, thing- Terry, can I interrupt you for a minute? Yes. There is a thing on chat that says, do these statistics star and so on have any correlation to location of schools? In other words, do Northern schools perform better than Southern schools or vice versa? Does age of the school matter? to the type of education they are getting? Well, without going back to that slide, um, just looking at Ben Franklin on the STAR assessment, you can see that um, they scored higher than all of the other schools. Uh, ben Franklin is considered a Title I school. Actually, all of our elementaries are Title I with the exception of Discovery and Kelly. Um, so uh, I, I, would say, I would say there's no exact correlation between student performance and age of building, if that clarifies the question. And Title I, uh, somebody's asking the question about Title I, uh, that would, uh, a school is identified as a Title I and is entitled to additional federal aid based on the number of students who are on free or reduced priced meals. And so 10 out of our 12 schools at the elementary level qualify. Our one middle school, South Middle School, also qualifies as a Title I school. Uh, and Valley Middle, excuse me, Valley Middle School qualifies as a Title I school as well. And so the additional funds are to supplement, not supplant any program, but it's to provide services above and beyond uh, what a school normally uh, would have. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's, let's take an elementary school, it's a Title I school, and they feel like they need uh, more social work services, more counseling services, uh, to help provide wraparound services for families in need, um, they can take those additional Title I dollars and invest those into additional people. Um, so they would get their allocation, their district allocation, counselor and social worker, but then they could have another one or two above and beyond that. So I hope, uh, Mr. Spore, that answered your question. Uh, student enrollment, um, we've been on the incline, thankfully, uh, over the course of the last seven or eight years with one dip. And that dip took place in 2018, 2019, uh, which really aggravated our budget for this year because we get our state aid funding formula based on the previous year's enrollment. So, um, so we went into this year uh, with another 120 plus students, uh, but we were getting funding on last year. So um, that, that cost us about 2 million coming out of our general fund. Um, just to get through this year, uh, which is an aggravant on the overall budget. Uh, district poverty rates, um, you can see through the 18-19 school year, uh, it's been hovering around 35, 36%. There were some years when it was higher. Uh, I do remember in 1997, I was the principal at Wilder Elementary School and following the flood, um, boy, that, that number just really, really took off. So. I think this is uh, kind of flattened out or more normalized uh, across the community. But I think what is interesting to many community members is they don't see these numbers and don't realize uh, that we do get a lot of federal aid for our Title I schools. Uh, special education enrollments, um, the, the number and the percent of students who qualify for individualized education plans has continued to increase over the course of the last 10 years. You can see where maybe it was a little bit uh, flat in 2008 through 2010, uh, but this number continues to climb. 
the Department of Education, excuse me, the Department of Public Instruction in Bismarck is well aware of this. They're actually monitoring uh, our percents because this would exceed um, what is considered normal. You know, 11, 12, 13% would be in that average range and why our percents are higher. I mean, we can argue that we know our kids better. We have different types of assessments, but um, that's not a very good argument because the assessments are pretty well, pretty well standardized uh, across school districts across the state. So for some reason, we just have a higher percentage of students, which then requires a higher percentage of staff to meet the needs of those students. Our English learner enrollments have been um, pretty flat the last several years. Uh, and that's probably more connected to uh, what goes on in Washington, DC than what happens in Grand Forks. So when the borders are open, um, you know, people tend to move into the states. Uh, in particular, they come to Grand Forks. And when the borders are closed, uh, then we see kind of a flat line uh, growth level with uh, any, any students who would be considered refugees or new Americans uh, who might fall under the auspices of English learners. And, and just uh, another piece of data, we, uh, we have 42 languages spoken in our school district. We don't necessarily have 42 teachers who can speak those 42 languages. Our elementary class sizes, um, I don't have last year's, but um, from 2018, 2019, this is pretty consistent to this year uh, at the elementary level. Actually, I think that number is the same. We've got 19 classrooms uh, with 15 or fewer students. And as you move across the matrix, you can see the uh, number of classrooms with 16 to 20 students, 21 to 24, uh, et cetera. Uh, the school board has been very committed uh, since my time in Grand Forks, and I came in 1995, very committed to keep class sizes um, at a reduced level, at a low level, particularly in K1, uh, K1 and 2, and 3 and 4. And there are going to be times across the district when there's a bubble and there might be a larger class. And then typically what we do is we offer more para support uh, to support that teacher with a large classroom. And sometimes it can be a little challenging in um, maybe a smaller elementary school where there's just a, a single classroom where it's not big enough to split, um, but it's almost too big to manage uh, for one classroom teacher. Quick, quick interruption, Terry, you have two chats. One is, is there a breakdown available of EL students per student for school? And the other ones you mentioned that, I think you answered this already, you mentioned that poverty rate percentages influence federal funding. Do IEP and ELL also result in additional federal funding? I think you answered that question already. Yeah. The, the IEP uh, students, uh, we receive federal funding, uh, certainly not, not nearly enough. Uh, and we don't get nearly enough from the state uh, because uh, the rest of it is covered by the local taxpayer. For EL, the, the check that we receive from the state probably doesn't even cover a teacher and a half. Uh, considering how many students we have. So um, that's something that we continue to lobby legislatively. Um, we've had a little success the last legislative session, um, but we're not nearly where we should be to provide uh, the amount of support needed uh, for EL students. And then the, the breakdown per school, I, I wouldn't have that in front of me. I can share with you that we do have magnet EL schools. Uh, Winship Elementary is one, Century is another. Uh, South Middle School would be considered an EL magnet school, um, and Valley Middle School has a smaller EL magnet program. One last question. Does the higher rate of IEPs dictate more physical resources? It's, it's dictating more physical space that's required. Um, we, we, uh, we have some students in some situations that uh, that they simply shouldn't be in. It's just a matter of how much square feet we have and what we don't have. Uh, a bird just flew into my window. That's why I looked away. Sorry about that. Um, so when, when our schools were built, particularly schools that were built, you know, more than 30 years ago, they weren't built with uh, IDEA necessarily in mind, even though IDEA uh, was instituted in 1974, Public Law 94-142, uh, providing special education services for students. But we see all types of students, medically fragile students, uh, students who come to us from other states. They, they come from what's called a level D or a level four facility. Uh, in other words, they're in a, a pretty highly specific self-contained area 
uh, as a result of behavior. And, and there are reasons why they behave the way they do. I don't think any, any student chooses to behave the way that they do. Um, so we don't have, um, we don't have level four or level D facilities in North Dakota. If you followed the news in Fargo over the last two or three years, um, they were going down that road to develop a level D facility. They got a lot of negative pushback uh, from the community. And then I think when there was a greater understanding of the purpose of the facility and that it would be attached actually to a school, um, they are now uh, moving down, moving in that direction to complete that process. Uh, we are not there yet. Um, but it's one of the topics that you'll see in the strategic plan for future study is least restrictive environment for all students. And I'll pause there in case there's another question in the chat. There is. The question is, is there an ideal class size? Well, it, it depends what level we're talking about. It depends what the content is. You know, you could have a uh, you could have an AP calculus class with, uh, you know, 30 students who all qualify for that class who will likely pass the AP exam, and, and that's not a difficult number. Um, but when you're working at the elementary level, um, I, I think what we have in place, you know, K1 and 2, uh, 18 to 21, uh, that's, that's a reasonable number. Um, but what our teachers are telling us, and, and some of you have heard me say this before, seven years ago, elementary primary teachers would say, if a student doesn't know how to read, nothing else matters. And now what our teachers have been telling us the last seven years is if a student can't socially, emotionally um, regulate him or herself, nothing else matters. And we're seeing more and more and more students um, who have those types of needs. Um, so we've really had to turn our teaching upside down to think about what is it that we do that aggravates those kinds of behaviors? And what are some strategies that we need to have in place that will help support those students? So we've spent a lot of time uh, with professional development over the last five years on helping teachers uh, with those kinds of strategies and with those skills. So, uh, but to really answer your question, lower class sizes do help. But if you really dig deep, deep into the research, um, you're really not going to find statistically uh, measured success as far as student achievement until you really get to a, a one to 10 student teacher ratio. Um, and, and we don't have that and nobody can afford to do that. So here's a little bit on the, on the revenue side. Um, our total budget is over hundred million. It's about 105 million now, uh, but you can see what the revenue looked like here in 2018, 19, 102, almost 103 million and what our uh, expenditures were you know, we certainly exceeded that by a couple of million. Um, most of that had to do with dealing with catastrophic failures at many of our campuses. So um, we've, we've had some budget difficulties. Um, I, I can get into all kinds of reasons why we've had budget difficulties. Um, there, were, there was a time where Grand Forks uh, really enjoyed, and it wasn't during uh, my time as superintendent, I'm just finishing my second year, um, but I'm, I'm going back 10 years and beyond, eight years and beyond, when we enjoyed this unlimited mill levy in Grand Forks. So um, the board could adjust the mill levy based on property taxes whenever it wanted to without going to voters. Um, so if we needed a little bit more money to do some capital project, um, your mills might have gone up by one or two or three mills and, and then the capital project would have been done. Um, when the state took over a higher percentage of our funding, um, back when oil was being pulled out of the ground uh, faster than you could shake a stick at. Um, we, we went about two to three years uh, enjoying those kinds of foundation aid payments from the state. But when it got to, I don't wanna say boom to bust, but when the prices of oil dropped and people weren't pulling oil out of the ground, that, that affected the overall state budget. And so those of you who work at the university or higher ed level, you felt that pain for four years where you were cut you know, constantly you're cut 5%, 10%, 15% over the course of three or four years. Uh, K-12 education was called, uh, will we'll hold you harmless, uh, which meant we're not going to increase your, your paychecks or your uh, foundation aid pay, um, but we're also not gonna decrease it either. Well, just with inflation, as each year goes by, you lose about 3%. So over the course of three to four years, 
uh, that affected our budget significantly by by almost 10 percent maybe even a little bit more than that and when we're trying to deal with compensation packages and those are going up but our revenues uh, staying flat or actually going down that's created really um, some large challenges for us and then and then what happens is uh, you look at your capital projects your your reinvestment in your buildings from a maintenance perspective and that's one of those cans that gets kicked down the road um, so here we are uh, with the facilities task force well that went way too fast let's see that was my fault, Terry. Um, I just I was going to try to take myself off a mute, and when I hit the space bar, it blew your slides. So I apologize. You can go ahead and, and reset your slides back to where you want to start from. But I just I wanted to remind the task force, though, real quickly too, that we will be in this process. We will be spending more than one meeting talking a lot more in depth about um, both Grand Forks um, finances. Uh, and how school finance works, and then also what different funding mechanisms there are to do projects and that type of thing. So um, if you have more questions around that stuff, um, fear not, we'll be spending a fair amount of time looking at those types of things through uh, a little bit later in our process. So just wanted to point that out real quick for folks. So Tom, I see where we're at on the clock and um, you know I can pause at any time. Uh, do you want me to continue and move quickly through the strategic plan? Yeah, what, what, why don't we keep moving? And if, if everybody's okay, we did start a little bit late. Maybe if you could try to, you know, maybe wrap up in the next, say, 10, 12 minutes, Terry. I don't have a bunch that I need to, to cover after your, your presentation. So um, why don't you go ahead and, and, and keep pushing, and, and we'll see if we can wrap up in about 10 or 12 minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the mill levy that I alluded to in my earlier comments. You can see uh, based on Fargo's mill levy and Grand Forks, that's a significant difference uh, in revenue just to reinvest in facilities. Uh, Scott Berge will talk a little bit more about this uh, several meetings down the road. Uh, some of you who were part of the community meetings last fall uh, heard that presentation and what it equates to per student. And it's not because Fargo has, you know, 4,000 more kids than we do. It's per student. This is how much more money they get based on their local uh, tax base than what we, what we get in Grand Forks. So I'm gonna take you through a few slides uh, regarding our strategic plan, and my colleagues will take you a little bit deeper uh, next week uh, in some of the deliverables of the strategic plan. So first of all, why do you do it? It's really to set the course for the future, uh, to embrace the inevitable change of which we're living right now, uh, to stay current and relevant and to be proactive versus reactive. And I will say that uh, we feel like we're really in a reactive mode uh, dealing with uh, some of the failures that we're having in our buildings um, because we just don't have the budget reconciled to a level where we can invest uh, three to four to five million dollars a year in our buildings that so badly need it. I'm just going to go down to the second uh, the second bullet here, what is a strategic plan? It's simply a document to use to communicate the organization's goals and priorities. So the purpose of our plan is simply to do that. It's to align what we value, what we believe in, what we say we're going to do, and put the resources behind it. So if there are any sacred cows uh, within the school district, wh whether it's a, a specific uh, course or a unit that a teacher might teach and that's not aligned uh, with our strategic priorities, then we don't. And the life of the plan is one to five years. We're looking at a five-year strategic plan and what we do operational each and every day, that's, that's what district admin, that's what principals, that's what teachers do. We do the operational piece um, in an ongoing manner on a daily basis. And it's always better to be in a proactive model than a reactive model. You can see what happens when you're in reaction mode and that's what it has felt like for the last year and eight months for me anyway. And the elements of the plan, we're uh, looking at leadership capacity, learning capacity, and resource capacity. I see a question down here and I wanna to respond to it because I do know the answer. What was the reason to not repurpose um, South Junior High or maybe repurpose it as a school? Uh, we didn't have the levy in place at that time, so FEMA would not, was not supportive of us to rebuild South Junior High or South Middle School on its existing site. 
I, I suppose had we had a crystal ball and knew that within four years we'd have a levy that protects the whole city, uh, maybe South Junior would have been South Middle right on that very same site. I hope I answered that question. So the priorities, we have three priorities in the strategic plan and I'm gonna give you just the skinny view. One is on academics. Uh, we're investing a lot of time and resources into high reliability schools. Uh, the second component is having a comprehensive school district mental health system. Uh, Jeff Gockler, you're going to hear from him. He's our district mental health coordinator. You'll hear from him uh, in a few weeks. And our third priority is resource management, long-term planning. That's master facilities planning. That's where all of you come in. Uh, technology will be a piece of the long-term master facilities planning and long-term financial planning um, will be part of the conversation and plan as well. I'm going to skip over this slide. This just has to do with uh, school improvement and accountability. And that also lines up with our three domains. And I already talked about what our future study will be about least, restrict, re least restrictive environment. Uh, and again, that's for all kids, creating an appropriate learning environment for every student in every classroom at every campus. Or just hit my window again, in case you heard that. And so through this overview, you know, we hope that you have a better understanding of our history, uh, some of our academics, and the strategic plan. And again, I wanna thank you for your service on this task force. And I will be available for questions either now or at a later date. Um, but we want to make sure we get out of the way and let you do your work. So thank you. The bird is okay. Thank <laughs> you. All right. Um, so I uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Brenner, uh, for uh, providing that, that overview for us, kind of a baseline that we can springboard off of. And so the next three meetings that we have queued up, we have uh, various people from the district set up to come in and talk about each of those components of the strategic plan. So next week we'll start with that academic uh, uh, high reliability schools framework piece. We'll go to that mental health piece and then we'll talk about resource planning and, and budgeting um, as, as it relates to that strategic plan. A number of these things will also then resurface in some of the other work that we're going to be doing. So. Um, we'll take time out to talk about things like equity, things like special uh, education. Um, uh, obviously, we'll have uh, some more in-depth conversations about school finance and those types of things, because all of those things obviously impact uh, our ability to, to bring forward a, uh, a recommendation ultimately when we're uh, done with this process. And so, uh, we talked a little bit about that at our last meeting and we got feedback from you guys on other things that you thought were important to talk about and obviously we're going to honor that and again as we go forward in this and you see additional things that maybe didn't come to mind at our first meeting but do after our fourth meeting um, please feel free to email brian myself um, so that we can try to take some thoughtful consideration on on considering you know that subject matter that you guys think we need to to try to cover all right, um, so with that, um, let's see if I can get the slides uh, to advance. Okay, um, so uh, we, we are at the end of the meeting. I think we did pretty well. We're about 7.27. Um, we, all, we will have a meeting next week, as we mentioned, on the 16th, and uh, where we'll, we will talk about some of those uh, academic pieces of the strategic plan and, and how, how that fits into the work that we're doing. Uh, we are, we, or we did record tonight's uh, meeting. And so the presentation, uh, as well as the narrative that happened uh, for the presentation will get posted up on the website. And I will send an email probably in the next day or two with a link to that information as well. It'll take us a little bit to download the, uh, uh, the recording uh, out of the cloud and get it up on the website and that. Uh, but I will email that to you guys. Um, and uh, there'll also be a, a copy of the, the PowerPoint presentation as well. So if you want to try to go back and review some of the information that's in there a little bit, um, uh, a little bit more detailed on your own time, uh, you can certainly do that as well. So with that, uh, hopefully this was a decent experience. We didn't get into any breakout rooms yet, but we will uh, try to explore that part of the technology soon. 
Um, and hopefully you all stay healthy, you stay safe, and you stay sane as you don't have a chance to connect with people as much as you used to. Um, and uh, if anybody needs to hang on for a little bit, uh, ask some additional questions, uh, or, or just wants to connect with us on some technical issue, um, we'll, hang, we'll hang out here in the room for a little bit. But other than that, I think we're done for tonight. So appreciate it, everybody. Tom, I just want to add one thing. You still there, Tom? Yep. Dr. Brennan and I were talking beforehand, and he asked me, uh, I was a superintendent for 40 years, and he asked me if I ever had to face anything like they're facing right now. And I faced a lot of challenges, but nothing compared to what uh, schools are facing now. And I just want to thank all the superintendents and Dr. Brenner and the administration and teachers for the effort they're putting into this. And uh, I know it's, it's different and it's hard, it's challenging, but uh, they're up to the task. So I want to thank you for that. Well, and, and I know teachers across the country are really, um, really standing up uh, for kids and, and helping people through this as well. And I'm sure your teachers are there in Grand Forks as well. Um, and so, uh, so it just uh, really goes to show how important our schools are uh, to us at, the, at this point in time. And I, I can say that personally, I've got kids in school as well. And, and um, so, uh, yeah, it's just a testament to, to what we, we can do when we need to. Thank you. Have a good night. Be safe. All right. See you, everybody.